So I'm going to talk about marginalisation in Australia. Most people have said, what is that? And I hope by the end of this you'll know. Um, but I'd like to start by, by posing the question, what do, we, what do we really need in life to survive and to thrive? Um, many of you will be familiar with Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of uh, needs. And the idea behind this is that you start at the bottom and work your way up. And uh, until you've got the bottom one uh, sorted, your physiological needs met, you can't move on to the next one, which is safety. And not until you've got that sorted can you move on to the next one, which is love and belonging, and so on through needs for esteem and self-actualization. And this is a lovely model that's been enormously influential. But in terms of empirical research, it has been uh, um, mixed in its results, and it's quite difficult to show empirical support for this. And I think a major reason for that um, is because this one actually comes first. We tend to think in terms of survival that the very first thing that we need to do is stay alive, therefore feed ourselves and stay safe. And actually it isn't. The very first thing that we need to do is to belong and be loved. And I hope I'll be able to demonstrate that to you. The very first experiments that showed this um, were carried out by Harry Harlow, who died about, um, uh, what would that be, 30 years ago. And he is famous for his experiments with rhesus monkeys. Some of these experiments have led to the new ethics uh, or the modern ethics around animal research in science that we have today, and you'll see why in a sec. But he experimented on isolation among monkeys as a way of looking at social development and the development of capacities generally. And uh, he, uh, over, the, over about a 20-year period, he did dozens and dozens of experiments with lots of different modifications to them. But basically, he divided monkeys into three groups and then watched what happened to them. In the first group, um, he, uh, uh, he allowed them to have normal socialising. So he let them grow up with their mothers in their, in their monkey tribes like normal monkey babies. And they grew into normal babies and normal adults. So that was all fine. I should mention, by the way, one of the things he absolutely loved doing was being provocative. These experiments in normal science are called uh, experiments in attachment, and attachment theory has grown out of it. He called them love experiments because he loved to annoy, and he really did annoy his scientific friends with that term. <laughs> the second group were brought up in a form of isolation, but not complete isolation. This group were raised in cages where they had a cloth mother, like the one you can see in the picture, a wire frame with a little bit of terry toweling wrapped over it. They were given everything that a baby, uh, that people thought in the 1940s and 50s a baby needed, like um, they were kept warm and clean and given medical care and fed properly and so on. But they weren't allowed any contact with their tribe and they were kept in a cage where they could see and hear other tribe members, but they had no contact with them at all. And these grew up into clingy adults that wouldn't experiment and wouldn't go anywhere or do anything. And the third group, and I apologize in advance for this photograph, were kept in complete isolation. These monkeys were kept in a cage. They were similarly kept warm and fed and uh, looked after in every way that was considered necessary. And this is how they ended up. They developed profound psychological disturbance. And in various uh, permutations on these experiments, he found that once they'd been in isolation for about a year, it was actually impossible to remediate them. They couldn't be, they couldn't be healed. And you can imagine the kind of furore these experiments created. And everyone said, oh, well, these are just animals. This would never happen. And lots of human experiments ensued. And every one of them showed pretty much the same thing happens in humans. They initially started looking at uh, little babies kept in isolation wards in hospital as they were if they had infectious diseases or uh, children brought up in 1940s and 50s orphanages. And then they found reasons to explain that and eventually looked at normal kids and, and then adults. And, and we're the same. If we're isolated, we literally die. And most, uh, many of these monkeys kept in profound isolation did actually die, even though they had all their supposed needs met. So love and belonging is what we really need. Like this, we need to be part of a social group and uh, we need to feel like we're connected to it, that we matter to them and they matter to us. What's always fascinated me is whether it would be possible to define quantitatively who gets isolated onto the margins of society and who gets to belong and be connected in the way we need to. And what happens to people if they are isolated? It's become a bit of an obsession, actually. And, um, and so um, in uh, 2006, I was very fortunate to be awarded some funding from a friend and colleague here tonight, um, 
uh, Andrew Whitecross from Faxia, to actually study this empirically. And what I wanted to do was to identify major categories of Australians, types of people um, that could be used for policy purposes so that Faxia and other stakeholders and interested parties could better understand who their clients were or what people were like. So if they were designing policy, they could do that in a much more accurate and targeted way. And I knew that, um, that I'd have to look at a whole range of things like family structure and relationship roles and belonging and health and psychosocial and economic factors and so on. Um, and that, that in doing that, what I hoped I would be able to do is draw out the key characteristics of particular categories so that so it would be possible to see their distinctive strengths and weaknesses and therefore target policies to build strength and address weaknesses in a systematic manner that would be likely to be effective. And to do that, I used data from the HILDA survey. I'll tell you a little bit about it because we, uh, we do a lot of analysis using these data and I'll refer to several other studies later um, that also use it. The Household Income and Labour Dynamics Survey in Australia is owned by Faxia and run on their behalf by the Melbourne Institute of Social and Economic Research at the University of Melbourne. If you're not familiar with this survey and you'd be interested, have a look at the website. It's extremely well structured and useful and it includes, uh, for example, all the questionnaires they've ever used. So if you're designing your own studies, you can use items from those questionnaires and then validate them back against nationally representative figures for those things. They used a two-stage sampling process to try to make the sample nationally representative. First of all, they randomly selected census collection districts from around Australia, and then within those, they randomly selected households. And then within those households, every person aged 15 or over was eligible to participate in the study if they wished to do so. The very first wave was collected in 2001, and very helpfully, it's collected annually, so wave one is 2001 and wave two is 2002 and so on, so it makes it easy to know which, which wave and which year you're up to. And all these people are tracked every year. Um, this, there's no other data collection like it in the world. There are about 19,000 people in wave one, and wave 10 has now been released. They're usually a year or so behind in being released. And this uh, data set contains an enormous wealth of social and economic and demographic and health and well-being and so on related data. And in wave six and for every wave after that, um, every four waves after that, an, an element, a module on personal social capital is included, which is all about people's participation and connectedness and belonging to their social group. And we also have a weather disaster exposure and impact screen that uh, Stephen struggled with a little bit earlier uh, from wave 10 included. So, um, so Faxia collects those data as well and we're able to analyze those. When I was trying to define like types, um, I was looking for a kind of analytic approach that would do this really well and settled on using a cluster analysis. I'm happy to answer questions on this later, um, it's a little bit uh, too detailed to go into now. But essentially a cluster analysis is a way of um, allocating people to multi-dimensional space on a very large number of variables or factors of interest in such a way that they're located in this multi-dimensional space at exactly the right distance from every other person in the data set. So for example, if one person is aged 16 and another person is aged 20, they will be exactly four units apart in this multi-dimensional space. And the same will be true for every single variable that they're measured on. And what this does is it creates a multi-dimensional cloud, if you like, of clumps of people who are a little bit like each other because they happen to score similarly on a whole range of variables. That's what happens in real life. People have characteristics that cluster together. And so what you can do in this, uh, in this analysis is create this multidimensional cloud, which is lumpy, and then, uh, then you sort of throw a net over the lumps to work out who belongs in which group and conduct various tests to make sure you've got these, these lumps defined as best you can. And these lumps are these uh, types of people who are much more similar to each other than they are similar to anybody else and different from all the other, distinctively different from all the, all the other types. And these here are the lists of variables that, um, that I used and that were important to give you a sense of how many um, uh, kinds of information are available in the HILDA data set that I was able to take account of. This analysis have produced five Australian archetypes, as I call them, major types of Australians that exist in society, in contemporary Australian society. I'll show you some slides, which are some very nice um, 
uh, photograph sourced by a colleague of mine, Tegan Cruis, that I'll talk to you a bit more about later. And uh, just to illustrate what these five types are. The first type is well-connected retirees. Um, they're not necessarily all that well off financially, um, and their health's going downhill a little bit as they get older, but they're otherwise great. They have the most fabulous social networks. They're very happy. Life's good. The second one is time-pressured couples with kids. These are the, the standard mum and dad couples um, with kids under 15, and they're, they're busy. Money can be a little bit tight at times, but they're basically OK. These are the financially secure couples. Um, we all love this photo. They're so smug, aren't they? <laughs> it's what I aspire to. <laughs> so these are the double income, no kids, or, or else the, um, the people who are a little bit older and have had children, the children are now grown up. And even though they seem these days to actually refuse to leave home, they're nevertheless fairly happy with life and very well off. They're the, they're the have it all group. These are dissatisfied working age singles. So these are a bit, you know, you can see yourselves, can't you? In the <laughs> this is where I am with aspirations to move somewhere else. So, so these people, you know, look like they've got it all. They've, they've got a great job, um, uh, good income, nice place to live, good health, you know, young, all the rest of it. What's there to complain about? But complain they do. For some reason, they're not happy. And the main reason is they haven't got a partner. And quite a few of them are stuck at home with mum and dad because they're saving for a mortgage or they can't afford to live out. And they're bad-tempered, let me tell you, especially the younger ones. <laughs> any of you that have got any of them will know this. <laughs> and this is the final group. And uh, when I realised I'd identified this group, I was very happy and very sad. These are marginalised Australians. They're radically different from the other four groups. Everything is not okay in their lives on pretty much every dimension that you could imagine. Financial circumstances, social circumstances, relationships, health, everything that you can imagine could be bad in life. These people have got it. And uh, Tegan particularly liked this picture because the, the woman in the picture is holding a little baby. And uh, children disproportionately grow up in these families. So these families, um, many of whom are single parents, um, have uh, just under two kids per family compared with a little, little bit over one in every other family. So in terms of where Australian kids are growing up, this is it. Of course, there are not just five types of Australians. There are lots and lots of other types. And, uh, and I did some supplementary analyses that identified 12 subtypes. And there are more subtypes within that, um, of course. And uh, I'm focusing on this one today because I think it's of particular interest and particular need. And you can see that within marginalised Australians, there were three further quite distinct types. Disadvantaged, mature age singles who tend to be male, aged about 50, usually with a really horrible lifelong dis disability or really horrible chronic illness, that kind of thing. Very little hope. Um, disadvantaged couples with kids, actually much like the time pressured couples with kids, but really, really poor and really struggling. Often they have a major health issue or some other thing in their lives that makes their lives really hard and disadvantaged single parents. These are 90% single mums, but there's about 10% are single dads. And uh, actually about a third of single parents are in the dissatisfied working age singles group and um, not in this income support reliant group. So it's really these income support reliant, really disadvantaged single parents that are struggling. And in fact, they're the worst off in, um, in society. Um, the poorest are the um, single elders that are usually Widows, when their husband dies, they're plunged into poverty. And the hardest working, most pressured, are the um, working single parents, usually women also. But we're going to have a look at the marginalised Australians. And, um, and I've broken them down into those three groups to give you a bit more of a sense of what's going on for these people. One of the things that you find with marginalisation is, characteristically, you get a very strong patterns of early life disadvantage and intergenerational disadvantage. So these people have grown up in families where dad was unemployed, parents were divorced at a time when divorce was not common. They typically left home, or very often left home, before they were 18, which doesn't happen unless something's going wrong at home. And they typically left school under 16, so with no qualifications at all. And this uh, chart shows you this. You can see here that um, the, uh, the solid bars are the proportion of people who left home under 18 and the checked bars are the proportion that left school under 16, 
And you can see the four other archetypes on the left, the connected retirees in blue, the financially secure couples in pink, the couples with kids and the dissatisfied singles, and then the marginalised Australians I've split into the three subgroups. And um, apart from the connected retirees who, given their age, very commonly did leave school under 16, you can see how distinctively different the subcategories of marginalised people are. Um, and, you know, as I said, kids don't leave home before they're 18 or leave school before they're 15, usually without good reason. If we look at physical and mental health, we see a somewhat similar pattern. The green line is physical health, and the higher the score, the better the health. And the blue line is mental health, and again, the higher the score, the better the health. And the 12 archetypes in this case are arranged along the bottom axis there in accordance with their physical health. And you can see, um, you can see that the marginalised Australians here have very poor physical health relative to the other groups. And these people are in their 30s, maybe 40. Their physical health is not that different from that of the retirees 30 or so years older than them. So they're really struggling with physical health. But what stands out really strongly is their mental health. You can see the retirees' mental health is just fine, like everybody else's. In fact, if anything, a bit better. For the marginalised people, mental health really stands out. They really struggle in this department. And finally, they, they also show very characteristically low levels of participation and, and support. Community participation, at the, in this particular instance, measured by whether people belong to community groups or not. So, for example, whether they're in a sporting club or a choir or volunteering or something like this. Uh, that's represented by the bars, which shows the proportion of each group involved in that way. And the line represents social support. And again, higher scores mean more and better. And they're organised according to the, um, the social support, the line. And you can see again that, um, that marginalised Australians are distinctively lacking in both community participation and social support. They're very isolated, they're very much on the margins of society, not participating, not there, not in the game. So having, when I did this study, um, from the moment I saw the findings long before they were published, I remember sitting there looking at my computer screen thinking, oh my God, where are they now? What's happened to these people? And, uh, and finally, I've had the chance to, to work on this problem and look at these marginalised Australians a decade later and see where they ended up. And um, it's been absolutely wonderful working with my uh, close colleague Alan Duncan on this and a team that we've led um, to, to look at this problem. And uh, there he is, in case you don't know him. Um, Alan and I have a, a very enjoyable and rich program of a joint research program into economic, social and health projects. And uh, this is one of the areas of research that we do together. And, um, and we're very grateful to the ACT government for funding for this. And this is Tegan who joined our, our group to undertake these analyses on a day-to-day -day basis. She's just submitted her PhD in psychology at the ANU and uh, has gone to be a postdoctoral fellow at UQ and stayed close to our group and is still working on us, uh, with us, on this with us. Um, and we're connected in with her group at UQ as well. So what we did was we tracked people from wave one of Hilda to find out where they were in wave 10. And to do this, we had to have a way of identifying every single marginalized person that was in wave one and then identifying every single marginalized person that was in wave two, uh, wave 10 and then see who was the same and who was different. And in order to do this, we created a kind of binary logistic regression equation. And what that, what that did was created a probabilistic model which basically allows us to have a, a good guess, if you like, at who was marginalized and who wasn't. And what we've been able to do, this took about uh, six months to work out, actually, and I'll show it to you later for a, for a laugh, um, but not now. Um, but it was able to identify with 99% precision who was marginalized and who wasn't, both who's in and who is not in. And that way we could work out who had exited over the 10-year period and who had persisted in marginalization. And we looked at uh, predictors of exit in all, all of these five main domains that, um, that I'd used in the first place. So we looked at uh, financial circumstances, health, social isolation, social circumstances, stigma, and early life and intergenerational disadvantage. And actually, the thing that stands out really from some, I, I, won't, I, won't be, I won't have time to go into this in detail, but the thing that stands out about marginalization is it's not, my, it's not mainly about money. It is about money. Marginalized people are very poor, but they're not as poor as other poor people in society. There are other groups that are poorer. 
It's mainly about these health and social factors. It's mainly about being on the edges of society, not about poverty. So when we were doing these uh, analyses, we controlled for the degree of marginalization in all our analyses because, of course, the level of marginalization varies from person to person, and we didn't want that to infect our results. So first things first, we were really surprised by this finding and really pleased by it. Actually, about 60% of people who were marginalized 10 years ago did get out of marginalization. Now, that means 40% stayed in over a decade, which is way too many for way too long. But nevertheless, given where these people started out, it's extraordinary that they got out at that rate. The ones that did escape or exit were different from the beginning in lots of different ways. These are, these are four of the key ones. They were less marginalized to start out with, and that, that makes sense. They were also older. It was a disadvantage to be younger. They were male. Most marginalized people are women, and it's an advantage if you're marginalized to be male. You've got more chance to get out. And interestingly, they were receiving income support. Normally, receiving income support is an indicator of bad things happening in your life. Actually, if you're marginalized, it's a really good thing. It can be just the leg up you need to get out. Um, Given that starting point, over the 10 years that ensued, here are the four things, the four strongest things for getting out. First, they got an education, then they got a job, then they got a relationship, usually a bloke, and they didn't get pregnant again, for the women, of course. Um, actually, when, uh, when the men did have another child, that made absolutely no difference to their uh, marginalization. When marginalized women got pregnant, that increased by eight to nine times their risk of remaining marginalized. You might have seen the Canberra Times this morning that uh, interpreted this to mean that I was uh, in favor of abortion for all marginalized women. <laughs> it wasn't quite the way that I would have interpreted it, but anyway, but it does have implications for, for family planning services and those being widely available to those who want and need them. What's really interesting here is that if you look at this list here, for the most part, they're not modifiable. There's not much you can do about these, not anything in the case of some of them. So where you start out within marginalization is something you've got not much control over. But in terms of getting out, um, there's an awful lot you can do about these. These are modifiable. There really are things that have an enormous positive impact that can be done and really do work and get people out of marginalization. I'll show you just a few examples. So this slide is going to show you how, uh, how people are different in terms of non-modifiable factors at the outset. And here we have, for example, leaving home under the age of 18, which generally speaking is a really bad thing to do, unless you've got a very good reason to do it. And you can see here three groups, the persistently marginalized on the left in blue, those who exited marginalization over the decade, and then on the right, those who were never marginalized. And this is the proportion of people in each of those groups who uh, left home before they were 18. And you can see how the persistently marginalized group is very distinctively different from the, um, from the group that exited marginalization over that period. So really, uh, so if you, if you left home under 18, you've got something like um, a 66% chance of staying marginalized. Um, while only about 40% of people who exited were leaving home at 18. You can see that those that exited marginalization didn't get back to the same levels of those who were never marginalized, and you see this pattern again and again. So if we look at some of the modifiable factors, first of all, obtaining full-time employment. On the left, you can see the persistently marginalized, the exiters in the middle and the never marginalized on the right. And on the left axis, you can see the proportion of people who had obtained a full-time job by the end of the decade. And if you look at the persistently marginalized group, you can see that hardly any had a full-time job at the beginning of this, and even fewer had one by the end. If you look at those who exited, very, very few had one at the beginning, but by the end, over 30% had got a full-time job. Again, they never achieved the same levels as those who were never marginalized, but there's a huge difference between the persisters and the exiters. Interestingly, what we found was having a part-time job did not help at all, and in fact was related to slightly less chance of exiting marginalization. That's a finding that we need to look into a bit more because it doesn't make sense on the surface. This is having a tertiary degree, and again, you can see the three groups, the persistently marginalized on the left, 
Almost nobody had a tertiary degree in 2001, and almost nobody's got one 10 years later. For those who exited marginalization, quite a few more had a tertiary degree. Lots more got one over that decade. Again, they don't get to the same level as the people who were never marginalized, but you can see they're in much better shape than those who stay marginalized. And interestingly, and we don't yet understand this, this is not true for getting a certificate or a diploma. It, the advantage was only obtained if they, if they went all the way and got a tertiary degree. This one's about mental health, and you have to um, read this graph a little bit differently. These bars show the probability of rem retain, uh, remaining marginalized depending on your mental health status. So the red bar in the middle represents people whose mental health didn't change over the decade. So their mental health was exactly the same in 2001 as it, was in, as it is in 2010. And you can see around 50% of those whose mental health status didn't change remained marginalized. About 33% about of those who made a significant recovery were still marginalized a decade later. But for those who had a significant decline, almost two-thirds were marginalized a decade later still. So an improvement in mental health was a really great thing, and a decline was a really bad thing for their marginalization. So mental illness is a really big part of marginalization. It's a big part of becoming marginalized in the first place, and it's a big part of not being able to get out of it once you're in it. So we conducted a study to look at what predicts better or worse mental health among marginalized Australians. And this was a project led by, um, by my colleague, Leon O'Brien, that you'll meet in a sec. And we're grateful for the, um, to the ACT Medical Research Council for funding for this study. We used the HILDA survey again, and this time we used wave six of the survey because it has particularly good information on social participation and mental health and, and so on. So here's Lane. Lane works with us as, a, as a, a fellow, and she has a joint appointment at the ANU, uh, where we worked together for a number of years before we, we both, um, both came here. She's particularly interested in the ways that social participation affect well-being for all sorts of different people, not just marginalized Australians. This particular study looks at marginalized Australians. And we had about 500 people in this study. And you can see, again, the women outnumbered the men about two to one. That's, you find that in every sample. The women are much more overrepresented. Um, if you'd like information about how we actually did this, let me know and, or, or have a chat to Leon afterwards. Just to uh, summarize some of the characteristics, they were mainly female. They were under 40. Marginalized people tend to be younger. They had resident children. Many, of course, were um, uh, single mums. Um, when you ask people a question in a survey, you know, in, an, in a dire emergency, could you, raise a, could you raise a couple of thousand dollars? Most people will say yes, or be pretty tough, but yes, I could. Marginalized people will say no to that question and other questions like it. And, uh, and in this uh, sample, as in many others, they did. And they had, um, the sample had unusually high rates of single mums, people reliant on income support for almost all their income not finishing school, being unemployed, and so on, much the characteristics that you're now used to. Now then, I just have to explain how to read this. These are predictors of worse <coughs> mental health. So what we have across the top is the zero line, and that means that's the point at which mental health doesn't change, no better, no worse. Where the bars drop below zero, that means that thing is related to worse mental health. So if you're a marginalized Australian, then these things are what matters. Down the side, we have si a size of effect, and that basically is a, a measure of how strong that item is. And again, happy to talk more about that later. The men are in blue bars, and the women are in those uh, yellowy colored bars. And you can see for the men that for marginalized men, coming from an ethnically diverse background, in other words, not being a, a white Australian-born man, is related to worse mental health. So men who are marginalized, who come from an ethnic, ethnically diverse background will have worse mental health. The same is true if they have a, a serious health condition, such as a long-term chronic disease or a disability or something like that. That's true for women as well, but much less strongly than it is for men. When it comes to what predicts good health, we've got the bars going up from zero now. For men, you can see that informal social connections, and particularly having a full-time job that they enjoy, and the that they enjoy is the important bit, 
is great for their mental health. So when men are marginalised, if, if, if they can get connected, they can have a job they, they enjoy or enjoy reasonably well, uh, that's really good and one a major pathway to, to getting out of marginalisation. For women, informal social connections matter as well. So does their couple relationship. If they're in a couple, if the relationship's good, that's a big plus. Um, so is low parenting stress. And if they're not in a couple, but they're a single parent, then having younger rather than older children is helpful, mainly, as uh, many of us will know, because bringing up teenagers can be just a tiny bit stressful occasionally. And uh, the thing to note here, again, with marginalisation is that social factors dominate. These people are really poor, but it's not their poverty that's getting them here or keeping them here. It's social factors. You notice also that there are more factors related to women's mental health than there is to men. This is because women are more complex and interesting than men. <laughs> so... We've established that positive social participation is important for mental health, especially among marginalised people. So what we need to know now is, if you were to intervene and improve participation, would that be helpful? Is, is it their mental health problems in the first place that are causing problems, you know, lack of participation? Or is it that if participation increased, their mental health would improve? Or is it a bit of both? So I'd like to introduce you now to, um, to my colleague Ning, who's quite annoyed about me putting his photograph up like this, but he'll get over it. <laughs> He's a postdoctoral fellow with us, uh, actually with my group at the ANU. He has a PhD in physics, but has realised that that was a mistake and has recently submitted a PhD in economics instead at the Crawford School. And, um, and he's a visiting fellow with us here at UC, and we're very hopeful that he will see his pathway here in the future. And he's conducted this study on the dynamics of participation in mental health over time to see if we can unpick that a little bit. Um, we used the HILDA survey again. This time we used waves 5, 6 and 7 so that we could do a longitudinal analysis. And it goes a bit like this. First of all, we draw what we call a panel sample. And what that means is the same participants are present in every wave so that we don't have any problems to do with them being different people. They're the same people every time. So if they change, it must be down to them, not down to something else. So, uh, so we had a sample of around 7,000 for that. Now we have a mental health screen in every wave of the HILDA sample, so we could use that. We could look at mental health before, during and after we look at participation. So we looked at participation in wave six because there are lots and lots of uh, details on that in wave six and then mental health on either side of that. And uh, this is the model. So what he did first of all was to look at whether mental health um, at time one, in this case in 2005, predicted participation at time two, uh, in this case in 2006, allowing for mental health in 2006 as well, because we already know mental health and participation are linked to one another, so we didn't want mental health in 2006 confusing mental health in 2005, so we used a, a statistical method to get rid of that so we could just look at participation. And then he looked at whether participation in wave six, stripped of all its mental health stuff, predicted mental health in wave seven. And because we know that a whole lot of other stuff is related to both participation and mental health, some of those things at the bottom and lots more, we accounted statistically for all of those as well to try and get this measure, this assessment, as clean as we could get it. That's pretty clean. And this is what we found. We found that mental health predicts participation for sure. And also that participation predicts mental health, net of all those past mental health things, are very little, but it actually matters. When you're talking about 24 million Australians, a little really matters. And some key things to notice, we looked at uh, different aspects of uh, participation, informal social connections, which are you know, hanging out with family and friends and neighbours, that kind of thing. Civic engagement, which, which is a little bit more organised, such as volunteering and belonging to community groups and sporting associations, that kind of thing. And political participation, which is what it seems. And what we found that was that mental health in uh, 2005 most strongly predicted informal social connectedness in 2006. It also predicted the others. And this is exactly what we find in cross-sectional studies too. The absolute best thing for your mental health is your friends and extended family. Or in the case of women, their friends, because the extended family always means more work. 
So there's a little bit of a sex difference there. Um, we also found that your mental health in 2006, even allowing for your participation, was by far the strongest predictor of your mental health in 2007. But net of that, taking that out of the equation as we did, your participation still predicted your mental health a year later. So, so for example, if you had great mental health in 2005, chances were in 2006 you were participating more than other people, chances were in 2007 your mental health's better again. If you had um, serious mental health problems in 2005, chances were you were more isolated in 2006 and worse mental health again in 2007. That's a really important pathway to predict, particularly when you look at it this way. If you think about where you might put interventions to help people, what might you do? When it comes to mental health, there's a lot of potential for individual small-scale uh, interventions. And if you can improve someone's mental health, you certainly can improve their social functioning, and then they might be off and running because that starts to be a positive thing in its own right. Thing is, doing stuff one at a time, when 20% uh, of Australians have a mental disorder any year, several million people, um, is quite time and resource intensive and not necessarily efficient. But what about if you put an intervention here? You could make a large scale intervention here and because it's systemic, because it's attacking the systems and social structures of society, um, it will do all sorts of things in addition to improving mental health. Builds cohesion and we have lots of evidence to show that and that has multiple desirable outcomes better educational attainment, better chance to get a job, better health, better relationships, um, happier kids. Everything you can think of is assisted by higher levels of social cohesion. And this is cheap and easy as an intervention relative to one-on-one -on -one mental health interventions. So it's really important to understand the importance of, um, of connectedness and participation. So much for the theory. What does uh, marginalisation look like in real lives? So what I'd like to do now is give you three brief examples of, of what that might look like. One in terms of a barrier to participation, what sorts of things get in the way of participation. We know that participation is really great, uh, usually. And, um, and then also, what happens when something really bad happens? And in this case, I've looked at a couple of weather-related disasters to illustrate that. So first of all, a fishy tail for something a little bit out there. Um, this is a part of a program of research being conducted by my colleague uh, Jackie Shermer that you'll meet in just a sec. And she mostly looks into stuff in natural environments, natural resource management and so on. But she's become interested in recreational fishing and has conducted this study with some really interesting results. But what, she's, um, what she's asking is, or what, she, what, she, what she says is, and what's evident in the uh, literature and studies so far, is that Recreation in the natural environment is really good for health and well-being. It does you wonders, as you no doubt know whenever you've been into the bush. But nobody's ever done any research into who benefits from this and how they benefit and whether there are barriers to benefits for some people. So, so we ask the question, is recreational fishing, as an example of enjoying the great outdoors, always recreational? Um, here's Jackie. She's, um, she's also um, a senior research fellow um, in SARAF and a visiting fellow at the Fenner School at the ANU where she did her PhD and where we um, have a number of mutual uh, connections and projects. And this is what she's found. The, um, the yellow bars represent the proportion of people who fish more than 30 days a year and the blue bars represent the, propor the proportion of people who say that they fish to eat. And they're divided into three groups. On the left is the low income group, the middle income group in the middle, and the high income group on the right. And uh, the low income group is people earning less than $40,000 a year, so they don't have much money. And uh, while I've said money isn't everything, it is a big part of marginalization, and it's a good indicator of being marginalized. And you can see among these gr this group, there's a much la larger proportion of people in this very low income group who fish frequently and also who report that they fish to catch something to eat. So this looks like a great idea. What an excellent way of getting free food of the highest nutritional standard for you and your family. Um, but it's not easy. If you're poor, it's harder to fish. The yellow bars here show the proportion of people who feel that they're unfairly treated by fisheries and other regulators of uh, recreational fishing. 
and the blue bars show the proportion of people who find it easy to um, comply with all the rules around recreational fishing. And you can see here that the low-income group are much more likely to say that they feel unfairly treated and also not to say that they find it easy to cope with the regulations. And there's lots of other research in different fields that shows these perceptions that probably reflect reality. When people are marginalised, not only are they in the most difficult situation, but society itself keeps them there. It puts up barriers and it actively manages those barriers to keep them out. And um, this sounds perhaps not quite true, it sounds harsh, but any number of studies demonstrate this very, very clearly. So it's harder to fish if, you po if you're poor, and yet you need to fish. This study is looking at uh, the impact of um, the big dry, or sometimes known as the millennium drought, on people living in uh, Australian cities versus those living in rural and remote areas of Australia. Um, we know that marginalisation is very common in rural and remote areas, so we know what happens in these areas is likely driven by and driving marginalisation. And um, I don't have time to explain how we developed this categorisation of drought, um, except to say it took a couple of years, and um, uh, Leigh and uh, O'Brien led this study as well, and we'll be more than happy to debrief and unload and so on to you later. Um, but basically, looking at the millennium drought, we used uh, the Hilda survey, waves one to seven, which coincide with the drought. We stopped at wave seven because the rains broke in some places at the end of that year, and we didn't want it to have rained anywhere. And we found that people fell into, yeah, <laughs> um, fell into five categories, um, and they got increasingly bad. So the first category was uh, people who experienced zero to, to moderate drought. The next one was they might not have had an awful lot of drought, but it was very dry when it was dry. The third one, the yellow one in the middle, is um, long periods of drought. The fourth one is pretty much constant drought, even if it wasn't always very, very bad. And the last one is a combination of constant and long drought, so very severe, going on all the time, um, really bad. Um, what you can see here is the, um, the results on the K10 for people living in Australian cities. Now, the K10 is a screening instrument for mental health. It measures general psychological distress by finding out general symptoms, non-specific symptoms of uh, depression and anxiety. So it doesn't diagnose any particular disorder, but it's very indicative of the presence of mental health problems. And you have to score 16 on this to attain moderate levels of distress. Under that, you've got zero, low, or less than moderate distress. So you can see in cities, drought is not a distressing thing. In fact, if anything, the worse it gets, the, better, the happier we are. <laughs> and um, we think that might be because the barbecues never rained off and every night after work you can have a drink outside and it's lovely. Right? In rural and remote areas, it's really different. If you experience constant and long drought, it is really distressing. And that's because in rural and remote areas, drought means the loss of your business, your farm, possibly your family, your health, uh, your husband uh, killing himself on the farm, these sorts of things that we know from an anecdotal evidence. I remember um, uh, one uh, farmer telling me that um, she spent all day at the end of the millennium drought following her husband around the farm. She did nothing else, um, following around the, around the farm to make sure he didn't shoot himself when he left every morning with his shotgun. So what happens in rural and remote Australia is really, really different from what happens in comfortable cities. And we know that uh, people who live with marginalisation are very disproportionately represented in rural and remote areas. The, the last example I want to show you relates to Queensland's uh, Summer of Sorrow, the summer of 2010-11, uh, when Queensland was hit by Cyclone Nashi, um, the floods and then Cyclone, uh, sorry, Cyclone Tazi, then the floods and Cyclone um, Yassi. And this is a map that shows you where uh, intensive emergency services and other services were provided across the state. And um, with uh, the darker, the, the more red the colour, the more the emergency services that were required. And you can see pretty much the whole state has been affected and required sometimes very significant assistance. In fact, about four-fifths of the state was declared a disaster zone. And, um, and it cost uh, Queensland $6 billion just to repair the infrastructure, not counting anything else and of course not counting damage in other states. It was a huge disaster. 
And you might remember images like these um, that you'd have seen on the TV um, at the time over that summer. <clears throat> we were contacted by Queensland Health early in 2011 because they had heard that we'd developed this brief uh, trauma exposure um, and impact screen. And we started a partnership with them and adapted that screen for these particular disasters. And what they did was they created a module for their regular annual self-reported health status survey that they do every year to check the health and well-being of Queenslanders. And they inserted a module on the disasters into that. And uh, happy to talk about the structure of the sampling, which was quite neat. But um, we ended up with about 6,500 Queenslanders receiving this module on uh, trauma exposure and impact. And uh, just to give you a bit of a feel for the impact, um, nearly 1.7 million uh, Queensland adults said that they were personally affected by this in some way. And nearly a quarter of a million said that they were still currently distressed about it two to five months after the disasters had happened when we were collecting the data. It was absolutely huge. So, we asked them a whole lot of things. Um, what I want to talk to you today is about these two sets of questions. We asked them, you know, was anything damaged? And if so, what was it? Was your house damaged? Was the, the home of someone that's important to you damaged? Was your business damaged? Was your suburb damaged? And we could look at all of those later in terms of their trauma. We also created an index where we added up how many of these they said yes to, zero, one, two, three, or all four. And then we also asked them how we, how did you feel? And this is based on our other work with uh, post-traumatic stress and disasters. So we asked them, uh, you know, whether they thought they might die or be badly injured. If you want to know whether somebody is going to develop full-blown post-traumatic stress disorder and you can only ask one question, that's the question to ask. People who say yes to that almost always do. Um, we also asked whether they felt terrified, helpless or hopeless, another very strong predictor of trauma whether they were still currently distressed and whether they were worried about how they would manage. And we created an index of overall trauma out of that too. This work was, uh, was done by Janine Wilson, um, who's also here today. She's just about to submit her PhD on, in psychology at the ANU and has been working as a research assistant with our team for the last year. And uh, we're very much hoping that, um, that she'll uh, join the team on a, on a postdoctoral basis at some time in the future. She looked at um, the uh, general psychological distress measure, the K10 that I told you about before, the general screen for mental health problems against this cumulative exposure index. And this is what she found. So up the side of that on the y-axis is the K10 scores. The, uh, the red bar is the, the level at which you experience moderate distress and the, the bottom red bar and the top red bar is where you're experiencing severe distress. And then along the bottom, you can see on the left-hand side the people who had no damage to anything, and then those who just had damage to their suburb or um, their family or friend's house, their business or their own home. And then on the right, any two, any three, or all four of those. And you can see a small increase in distress once you get to two or more of those different uh, uh, zones being affected by the floods. Now this does not look like these disasters were all that distressing, and we know of course that they were. And the thing is that, um, that disasters tend not to have a generalized impact on mental, mental health, they tend to have a very specific impact, it's traumatic, not distressing. So if we look at our trauma scale, you can see a really different picture. And here it is you can see this very strong exponential curve whereby once you get to two or three or even four of these uh, uh, areas affected, you get very greatly increased trauma among the population. And not only is that trend highly statistically significant, but each step at the end is highly statistically significant. So these, um, uh, so these kinds of disasters, drought as well, but floods, cyclones, fires, whatever, they have a specifically traumatic impact. So what about people living with social and place-based disadvantage? We know that people living in socioeconomically disadvantaged suburbs or places generally tend to have a very high proportion of marginalized people living there. And we also know that, um, that disproportionately large number of marginalized people also live in rural and remote areas. So we split the, um, we split the sample by these. 
And what we found was, as you might expect, um, increasing, uh, increasing trauma with increasing exposure, but mo much more so for the disadvantaged people. They're the yellow bars compared with the, the more advantaged who are in the blue bars. So in other words, if you're, if you're living in a disadvantaged place, the same dose of exposure will give you a much stronger traumatic response. In other words, if you're already vulnerable, a terrible thing happening to you will hit you much harder than it would hit someone else. And you see the same thing in rural and remote areas. The people living in remote Australia are the green bars, and you can see the same kind of pattern for the same impact, for exactly the same impact, their exposure, there's a much stronger mental health impact. So some concluding thoughts. Um, marginalisation is about much more than just money, much more than just financial circumstances. It's about entrenched complex disadvantage and stigma and exclusion and having little chance in life um, are defining characteristics. It affects every part of life and everything you do down to something as abstruse as fishing. And what it does is create a background vulnerability. So life is really, really hard for you all the time. And then when something goes really wrong or a disaster strikes, it's much, much worse. Nevertheless, we've seen that even though it's very hard to get out and perhaps you don't get quite out, it is possible to exit marginalization. And isolation and mental illness are right at the center of this complex situation and have to be addressed, both of them together, if people are to get out of, um, uh, get out of marginalization. So if we're thinking about interventions, whether we're thinking from a policy perspective or a community sector or a service provider, perspective, we have to think about isolation and getting people participating positively and about what needs to happen for their mental health, part of which, of course, is not being isolated. If we can address isolation in particular, we may get very big systemic benefits for relatively little cost. And, uh, and we certainly know that for people in this situation, we need really complex, long-term, tailored interventions. A quick one-off thing is not going to fix it. Um, I'm grateful to my um, colleague Lane for drawing my attention this morning to this um, ACT government innovation called Think Place. Well worth a look at the website if you're interested in this kind of thing. What the ACT government has done um, has been to work with a very large number of community sector organisations and different parts of government and nine marginalised families in the ACT to actually talk to them about what they need and how best those services could be provided and it's got some really fascinating insights. So, what next? Well, Alan and I are very keen to look at the microdynamics of marginalisation. So, what happens to marginalised people year on year? What follows what? What are the pathways out of marginalisation? What kinds of things make it impossible to get out of um, marginalisation? And we're specifically, of course, going to look at those four key predictors of exit, education, employment, partnering and children, or no more children in this specific case and those very intriguing results about a part-time job and a diploma or certificate not being enough. We want to know more about that. We also want to have a look at the intergenerational transmission of disadvantage and marginalisation, particularly to find out what the um, adult leverage points are. So we know there are lots of things that you can do for kids, particularly in intervening in playgroups and schools, but once a, once a person emerges into adulthood and they are marginalised, what do you do then? <coughs> And of course, we will be paying special attention to mental illness and isolation. We also want to publish a brief screening instrument, um, so that uh, a kind of a checklist, so that um, uh, people who encounter marginalised Australians frequently can have a ready reckoner, a very simple way of finding out whether the person they're working with is marginalised, and if so, how much, in order to help them tailor their services better. Marginalised people show up in GP clinics, in Centrelink offices, in emergency departments, in hospitals, at police desks, and uh, seeking help from uh, non-government organisations very much more frequently than everybody else. Um, if we had a brief screening instrument and we could easily count the number of marginalised marginalized people, it means we could measure our progress uh, more easily as well when we had interventions or new policies. And uh, this screening instrument um, that we've developed is about 90% accurate so it's very accurate. It's not as perfect as our equation, which, um, which is 99% accurate. But I'll show you why we thought we wouldn't helpfully share this.
because this is it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm kind of amused by the idea of turning up to an emergency department and saying, I've got this really helpful thing for you. <laughs> Would you like it? <laughs> so uh, we, we thought that might not be quite the best thing. So, um, so our checklist uh, doesn't, doesn't have the accuracy of this, but 90% isn't bad. So, uh, so next year, we'll be publishing our first uh, national marginalisation report card. And uh, we'll look at marginalisation overall in Australia and also by the five domains. And we'll look at it nationally and by state. And we're hoping that this will be helpful information to have in the public arena and uh, possibly um, might even encourage states to learn from each other. And, uh, and in doing this, we'll be seeking partners because we think that this research, uh, all the research that we do, but this in particular has to be done with partners. It can't be done uh, in the isolation ward of a research centre. Um, we need to hear from and be able to talk to people involved with marginalised people in all sorts of different walks of life, um, and in particular, um, so that we can continue the research uh, and make it useful. And in particular, we'd like to publish the report card uh, with some partners who have an interest in this area. Thank you. <laughs>